Hi there. Have you ever gone to the dentist for a particular reason, but your dentist ends up telling you something else? Let's just say you go for pain in your lower first molar. So your dentist takes an x-ray and they find something unexpected. Like what? Bam! That's me right there. The dentigerous cyst. You probably didn't even know I was there. Well, that's because I'm usually asymptomatic. But we'll get into my symptoms later. So what am I? A dentigerous cyst is a cyst caused by the accumulation of fluid between the reduced enamel epithelium and the crown of an uninterrupted tooth. Now, I'm usually a developmental cyst, but at times, I can be inflammatory as well. Let's take a look at this picture. The green line represents the reduced enamel epithelium. As you can see, the space between the reduced enamel epithelium and the crown of the uninterrupted tooth has increased. Why is that so? It's due to the accumulation of fluid between the reduced enamel epithelium and the crown of the uninterrupted tooth at the cementola enamel junction, causing formation of me, antigerous cyst. Now the exact reason for the accumulation fluid is unknown, but it could be due to any alterations in the reduced enamel epithelium. Moving on to inflammatory. You know, sometimes these kids eat way too much chocolate and forget to brush their teeth properly. They end up getting a cavity in their primary teeth leading to a periapical infection. Now this infection lies very close to its underlying permanent successor, putting that tooth at risk because the infection can move on to the permanent tooth by affecting the reduced enamel epithelium, leading to the formation of, you guessed it, me, dentigerous cyst. So that's one of the inflammatory causes. Let's look at another. Many of us have a partially erupted tooth, usually associated with the mandibular third molars. Constant inflammation around this tooth, or a recurrent pericoronitis, can also lead to the formation of dentigerous cysts. So now that we know what I am, and how I occur, basically my pathogenesis, let's discuss my clinical features. I most commonly occur in men, white men to be exact, between the ages of 10 to 30. And I most commonly affect the mandibular third molars. It's my favorite tooth, followed by the maxillary canines, maxillary third molars, and lastly, the mandibular premolars. Let's move on to my symptoms. You know, I'm a pretty decent guy. I'm quite small, don't cause any pain. Usually asymptomatic. As I said earlier, you won't even know I'm there. Unless the patient takes a radiograph in that particular region for some other reason and discovers my presence. But this is only if I'm small. Very rarely, I can become large, causing facial asymmetry. But even then, I will remain painless and asymptomatic. But a large dentigerous cyst is very rare. On further investigations, you will realize that it's amyloblastoma or odontogenic cyst. At times, I can be painful, and that's usually only if I become infected. You know, I tend to be very good looking. I have a very clean cut look. And these dentists, they love to photograph me. So let's move on to my radiographic features. In a small cyst, you will see a well-defined unilocular radiolucency surrounding the crown of an uninterrupted tooth with a sclerotic border. But in infected cases, the border will be ill to find. Whenever these dentists ask me for a photograph, I like to pose in three different positions, central, lateral, and circumferential. Central is when I'm placed centrally above the crown of the tooth. Laterally is when I'm enlarged 
lateral to the tooth. And circumferential is when I tend to extend past the cemental enamel junction more towards the root's surface. I also tend to displace the tooth a considerable amount of distance. Now if I'm large, I will not be unilocular. I'll be multilocular due to the presence of bony trabeculae. Radiographic features alone are not enough to diagnose me. So let's take a look at the histopathogenesis. Now in an unaffected cyst, the epithelium will be non-characterized, usually flat around three to four layers thick. The connective tissue will contain loosely arranged fibers with epithelial rests. In an infected cyst, the epithelium will be keratinized and go into hyperplasia due to the increased number of cells. Rushton bodies will also be present. The connective tissue will be more densely packed and more collagenized with the presence of inflammatory cells. The most distinguishing feature is the presence of Fredipex. And finally, let's come to treatment. For a small cyst, enucleation along with extraction of the associated tooth is done, basically cystectomy. But if I'm large, resupilization is done. No, I'm not talking about the kangaroos. This is a surgical technique where they cut a slit into me and suture my edges to the exterior surface. It forms a continuous surface between the exterior and interior surface of the cyst, allowing it to drain out and decompress. Now I'll have you know that I have an excellent prognosis, thank you very much. Reoccurrence is uncommon, although sometimes my lining can undergo neoplastic transformation to ameloblastoma or squamous cell carcinoma. Well, that's very rare. Hey, fun fact, did you know I'm also called follicular cyst because of separation of the follicle? I'm also called paracoronal cyst since I surround the crown of the tooth. I'm the second most common developmental odontogenic cyst, occurring in about 20% of all cases. So let's summarize with some key points. A dentigeresis is the accumulation of fluid between the reduced enamel epithelium and the crown of an unerupted tooth, which occurs at the cemento enamel junction. I'm usually asymptomatic, and radiographically, you will notice a unilocular radiolucency with a well defined border. Well, that's my story. If you want to hear more of my stories from my relatives or my distant relatives, like odontogenic cyst or ameloblastoma, subscribe to our channel. Well, see ya and good luck.